when I'm gonna I'm gonna take the role as Elon Musk here. So bear with me. I tweeted in December of 22 that Twitter is not only a social media company; it's a crime scene. And then the following day, I tweeted, my pronouns are prosecute Fauci. I wonder what I've learned since I tweeted that out. Well, hello there. Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Collapse Life podcast. I'm your host, Zara Sethna. If you're new to the channel, please do us a favor and hit the like and subscribe button. Now, if you're someone who follows this podcast, you know better than to trust the mainstream media. So you won't be worried about the fact that Mother Jones magazine called our next guest a fixture on the right wing media circuit or that the Daily Beast calls him a fringe character in the MAGAverse. If those kinds of labels put you off, I certainly understand, and you should probably head back to watching CNN or The View. Nevertheless, I would like to personally encourage you to stay tuned and listen to what our guest has to say. If nothing else, Collapse Life is about fostering dialogue and a deeper understanding of the forces currently at play in the West. And that's why we have Ivan Raiklin in studio today. He's a constitutional attorney and a retired Green Beret. He served more than two decades in the Army and in our national security ecosystem. And best of all, he's dubbed himself the Deep State Marauder. And we're going to delve into this and much, much more. So Ivan, welcome to the show. It's great to meet you. No, same here. Absolutely fantastic introduction. Very unique. Uh, I would only uh, offer this, that the pronunciation probably should be, uh, I think you mentioned smother jokes. And raw sewage is how I would pronounce those two uh, publications that mostly got things wrong and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to correct them, which obviously they won't correct. But nonetheless, the viewer will decide for themselves the credibility and the courage of the author of those articles. And then they can judge the interaction that I actually had with those two that wrote those pieces uh, because I put it up on my X channel the full video interaction and you can see for yourself whether or not my side of the story which is the documented video is more accurate than the written up pejorative narrative that those employees were directed to write to try to attempt to do a hit piece on me yeah i mean it, it's pretty clear when you read those uh outlets you know exactly what you're going to get and they're you know talking to their particular echo chamber um but we'll get into that well, a little bit more they're basically tasked by their handlers and uh before i forget i mean Jamie Raskin has a big play in making sure that these outlets publish in the manner that they do uh, the hit piece on me because my deep state target list includes Jamie Raskin and his wife and we may have an opportunity to explain why they are on the list uh, because of their illegal, nefarious, treasonous activity. And now he's doubling down, saying that he's going to conduct civil war on January 6th. I don't know if you saw that. I didn't. So let's get into it. But I, I think we need to just back up a little bit before we get right into the details and um, and start kind of at a higher level. So Deep State Marauder, that's a pretty cool title. But I think there are still a lot of people who would claim that there is no such thing as a deep state. And then there are some others, you might be surprised, who may not even really understand what that phrase means. So I right. want to start kind of at the 30,000 30, foot level with your view of what is the deep state. Yeah, so my definition, and I mean, everybody can have their own uh, idea on what that is. The, how I personally define the deep state is the some people call it permanent Washington. I think that's what Tucker would use. But if you don't subscribe to his content, whatever. <clears throat> Bottom line is, deep state refers to the generational incestuous relationships of those in positions of senior level power in our federal bureaucracy that are not elected, but are in the system because they work through the system. Uh, and we'll explain how. Uh, but primarily through criminal actions and illegal, immoral, and unethical activities, and then leveraging their position to continue to escalate and remain in power. So that would be the deep state. And they, and they, are, they don't care about rules, norms, principles, procedures, and then the Constitution is not even a, a thought in, right. you know, within their decision-making process. And right. so when you, when you see... Or I guess that would be those, the cabal or the deep state. 
But the thing is, it's easy to hide when somebody accuses you, oh, you're deep state. There's really no risk to your continued lawless activity. When you start to identify the organization that is the most prominent deep state or illegal nefarious actor, then that's still not very, uh, it doesn't really apply any sort of pressure or motivation to act lawfully. When you start to drill down and go by name, date, place, and transgression by individual and the conspirators when that conspiracy started and continued, and then you step through that and then you articulate to millions of people who these people are, and you confront them in person, letting them know that you know, and you're going to report that you know, meaning me, to millions of other folks, and then you know where they live, you know their family ties and relationships, but more specifically their professional relationships. And let's just say if they have the ability to illegally use FISA procedures to spy on us, well, it begs the question, if the technology is there, off commercially off the shelf, for them to monitor us, what stops us from doing the same thing on them? Mm -hmm. To then be able to see evidence beyond any shadow of a doubt of their criminal, unconstitutional, illegal, belligerent activity. That's what I call marauding, because the... Okay. The term marauding means it's to maraud is the verb that is normally used in the context of when a pirate boards a ship and loots that ship for its treasure, its booty, its resources, right? But in my case, a deep state marauder is a pirate, if you will, going that's seeking to regain and retain our individual liberties, our constitutional order, and taking those rights that that ship, if you will, has taken away from the people. So we're just reclaiming what is already ours that they have stolen. All right. Let's, and thus let's... the deep state marauder. And I do it digitally and uh -huh. I do it in person. Let's get to some specific examples because I think you're right that the, the term deep state is so broad that... Um, that it's kind of easy to paint anyone with a brushstroke, but um, you claim to have uncovered some very specific examples of corrupt corruption and illegal activities. And um, you have, you say, evidence to support all of this. So give us one or two of the examples. Okay, let me see here. So I call August of 2024, Joseph Pientka Awareness Month, okay? <laughs> and most people have no clue who Joe Pientka is. And that's why I want to make it Joseph Pienka Awareness Month. By the way, his full name is Joseph Pienka III. His dad and I believe his grandfather also served in the FBI. So that means he's in the FBI. Where is he currently? He's at the San Francisco field office. Formerly, uh, I was told a couple of months ago, up until a couple of months ago, he was the head of counterintelligence. Would have, would have put him at like maybe the number three spot in that field office in terms of hierarchy and rank. Well, why is it important, the San Francisco field office? That's the office that spearheaded the coordinating effort between headquarters FBI and big tech to manage the entire digital censorship industrial complex that has been exposed now, in a more broader sense, by Michael Schellenberger and Matt Taibbi through the Twitter files. Okay, mm -hmm. That's your Joseph Pienka. One of his employees, if you will, or subordinates in that office is a guy by the name of Elvis Chan. Elvis Chan was the guy that was under oath, gave testimony in the Missouri v. Biden lawsuit on First Amendment, where he disclosed a lot of some of this stuff. Who was he coordinating with at headquarters? You have folks like the Foreign Influence Task Force Section Chief. Laura Demlo, who's now the number two counter intel officer at the director, Office of Director of National Intelligence in Bethesda, Maryland. But by the way, I used to teach for three and a half years from top to bottom, left to right, all aspects of our entire national security system. Mm -hmm. I know it better than most. Okay. Mm -hmm. I probably know it better than anyone that's they sent to me to be to investigate me. 
Okay, but we'll get to that maybe on what that looked like. Anyhow, so Joseph Pienka, before he was in San Francisco, he was the senior operations guy on the operation known as Crossfire Hurricane, which was the illegal spying operation on then uh, General Flynn. He signed off on the illegally, let me, let me frame it this way, the Woods file that was created to present to the FISA court to then spy on Carter Page, to then broadly spy on the Trump campaign and all those in, in the Trump campaign was predicated on two massive fraudulent enterprise activities. One, Kevin Kleinsmith, the lawyer on Crossfire Hurricane, one of them, was changed an email when he asked his CIA car- counterpart whether or not Carter Page debriefed with the CIA after his trips and communications in Russia in his private capacity. The CIA said, yes, he did. Everything was all above board. But Kevin Kleinsmith changed the email from yes to no and included that, along with Brian Otten, the supervisory and intel analyst assessment, with his communications with Bruce Orr, Nellie Orr. I mean, I'm... I can go into every single name of these 600 on my deep state target list. Yeah, let's not. But I won't bore you with those details. Go to the spreadsheet, and it, 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 it goes into category of criminal conspiracy. Bottom line, to kind of wrap this thing up, mm-hmm. the same people that illegally decided to spy on President Trump in order to protect the Biden criminal syndicate are the same people, like, not generally speaking, the same individuals that then further receive the Biden laptop to then hide it and cover for it, meaning Brian Auten, and then Joseph Pianka was in the San Francisco field office that would have been the one coordinating in some way, shape, or form with Twitter 1.0. And who was at Twitter 1.0 when the censorship regime happened? It was the former general counsel of the FBI, Jim Baker. The guy that authorized the illegal spying is now over at Big Tech coordinating the cover-up from his own exposure and the rest of his team. Mm -hmm. And Baker as the number two lawyer at Twitter. So Joe Pianka, in my research, although he's on my list, I present, based on my evidence, that he is probably the only person that has direct knowledge and access to every single person specifically within the FBI that did Illegal spying, the cover-up, the illegal uh, Mueller investigation. Like He knows all of them and has dirt on everybody and ran everything properly. He just didn't become a whistleblower. He is now at a point where my sources tell me he is this close to retiring. So it would be very prudent for him to then whistleblow on Jim Comey, Andy McCabe, Lisa Page, Peter Strzok, Catherine Seaman. Kevin Kleinsmith on their involvement in the illegal spying and the subsequent cover-ups that included the censorship industrial complex that covered for the COVID con, that covered for the illegal election, that covered for the big pharma con subsequent to the you know Wuhan Institute of Virology Fauci funded lab incident, and then subsequent from there that created the DNA mutilation injections. He'll be able to then showcase how possibly through his kind of talking about Jim Baker, where Jim Baker is probably going to, when we, when we pull the thread on his emails, his text messages, his internal Slack channel communications, and his Twitter direct messages, we're going to be able to see how he coordinated with the fact-checking team of Twitter 1.0, mm-hmm. which was co- subcontracted out to Thompson Reutards, the CEO of Reutards is also a board member of the the largest DNA distri- DNA mutilation distribution company in the world, known right. as Pfizer, when they did the whole DNA mutilation uh, right. distribution products that weren't FDA approved, that weren't safe and effective, and that just created you know, many tens of thousands, if not millions, of uh, heart explosions, uh, but millions of modification to DNA. And so... so- it's a, as you say, I mean, it's, it's a very deep web here that you're, you're talking about, um, 
elections we're talking about public yeah, health yeah, I, so, I mean, so by category yeah, there's different categories of those that are on my six it's they yeah. say it's 350 i think it's now 600 and it grows by the day as they yeah. conduct their legal activity and as we continue to you know continue to do our investigative analysis linking their staff members the family members and doing that i used to teach intelligence analysis and how to be a professional analyst so i use the same methodologies that every professional analyst learns how to do in our intel community and just apply it to the problems that i see that the media the the legacy curated manipulated media is not covering so mm -hmm. then it's incumbent on us that have the background experience to definitively say hey this is what i'm seeing based on my subject matter expertise background and uh network of people i mean i know okay. people still in the system that i can uh bounce it off of is that why you sort of feel like you've taken it upon yourself to do this? Because, I mean, surely, like, we, we all understand that there's a there's a ton of corruption when it comes to politics and the revolving doors between industry and government. And, and um, there should be accountability. I think many people would agree. But why have you put your efforts into this? Why have you taken it on as your personal crusade? Yeah, I, I would say the two driving factors behind that are you know, my parents fled the Soviet Union from communism in the 70s. And then uh, when I observed what the leadership, the failure, civilian failureship of our federal government did to General Flynn, uh, I smelled a rat and then I started digging. And to me, that was unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And then what really weaponized me against them is when they started to investigate me uh, without lawful predicate. And they try to basically circumvent my fourth amendment my fifth amendment my first amendment and so if no one else is going to really step forward and hold these people to task uh, what part of lawyer and green beret did i guess america right. not understand right so it now personal. now it's it's absolutely personal and if jamie raskin wants to promote a civil war the odds of him prevailing are extremely low like at the zero level, right? So what I'm referring to there is Jamie Raskin is absolutely one of the members on the list, and I'll explain why. And it Tell runs us who he is first, because for people who don't know. Jamie Ra There's a lot to unpackage here, because I can go into this, I can go into one hour per individual on the list. Okay. So let's focus no, just, in on Just rough, rough <laughs> sketch. <laughs> Jamie Raskin is a member of Congress from Maryland just across the river from D.C., okay? A couple things to, to factor in. Well, what committee is he on, all right? Oversight. He was on the January 6th cover-up committee, right? The Fed's Direction Cover-Up Committee. Uh, I can explain all the details and receipts. I have a three-hour podcast with Alpha Warrior explaining what happened on January 6th, and it was actually a Fed's Direction, and I explained who was involved, mm -hmm. and I can explain by name, and then who was involved in its subsequent cover-up. The first line of effort for that cover-up was Jamie Ratskin. Now, let's back up. His wife, Sarah Raskin. His wife, Sarah, used to work at the Treasury Department under the uh, the Barry Hussein and failed Vice President Biden regime. Okay, So during that time, she was one of the 39 individuals within the federal government that unlawfully unmasked and spied on General Flynn mm -hmm. in the transition period from 2016 to 2017 with the purpose of finding something on General Flynn to remove him from the equation so that he wouldn't be in position to expose the crossfire hurricane illegal spying operation on the Trump campaign to create leverage on behalf of both senior leadership of both political parties, Democrat, Republican, okay? And so that's Sarah. She's one of the 39. That's one of the categories of those on my deep state target list that are wanting for, demanding, and lusting for retribution, okay? So, that's Sarah. And what about her husband? Well, Jamie Raskin was the guy that Nancy Pelosi uh, chose in the summer of 2020 to come up with all the different courses of action to be able to stop a Trump re-election on the House floor on January 6th. Not my words. This is Jamie Ratskin's words in his own book. I read it all. Okay? Mm -hmm. 
And so, but one of the things that he failed to forecast and war game, if you will, for January 6th was the Operation Pence card memo that I had tweeted, that President Trump retweeted, which was I explained to Kevin McCarthy and Mike Pence's chief of staff that they should go ahead and object on the Electoral College vote by state delegation, do a vote by state delegation, wherein 27 states were Republican, 20 Democrat, and three tied up. So I never called on delay or, you know, move this and that. But when that was gaining traction and momentum internally, Nancy Pelosi ordered her sergeant at arms to go ahead and facilitate the intentional breach into the Capitol by mm-hmm. not pro- by ordering her head of Intel and Interagency Coordination Division and subordinate to that. So two individuals particularly, Yogananda Pittman and Julie Farnham in that office, to go ahead and not provide Intel to let's just say the chief of Capitol Police, Stephen Sun, to go ahead and have the necessary tools to then, on the seventh time, he would have requested with that intel, hey, I need more support to, you know, protect the Capitol. They didn't want that because they wanted to facilitate the breach to stop the objections from taking place how I explained they should, thus Mm -hmm. guaranteeing a re-election, thus the Fed's direction. Now back to Jamie Raskin. That was the context. Jamie Raskin, Ratskin was chosen to lead the second impeachment. So the second impeachment was in order to create the narrative of an insurrection. But the main, that was the publicly facing reason. The real reason was to flood the the media complex and divert everyone's attention from an illegally conducted election by 39 states because non-legislative actors ran their elections outside of legislative mandate uh, due to COVID rules, right? It diverted America's attention from the illegal certification that took place on January 6th because there was no quorum. And it also, most importantly, it promotes an insurrection narrative and it totally covered up the actual Fedsurrection actions taking place on that day that resulted in the murder of an unarmed, peaceful election justice rally attendee at the hands of a U.S. Capitol Police officer, Michael Byrd. I'm referring to Ashley Babbitt's murder. And then also the D.C. Metropolitan Police officer, Lila Morris's murder of yet another election justice rally attendee, peaceful, unarmed Roseanne Boylan. You didn't hear anything about that because Jamie Ratskin was focused on promoting the insurrection narrative. And as part of that narrative, he was claiming that Officer Brian Sicknick didn't die from the Pfizer fail. And he said that he didn't die from either the Pfizer fail or the Moderna mutilation, the two DNA mutilation injection products, right? Because J&J wasn't out at the time, Mm -hmm. early in that period. Because remember... First, they said it was a fire extinguisher. Then they had to say, oh, no, the coroner reported it was a natural cause. Was it which 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 natural cause was it? The Pfizer or the Moderna variant? We don't know. Anyway, back to Jamie Ratskin. Right. So he promotes this narrative. And then, well, it's interesting that he is interviewed in questions and provides a statement, very bold statement to raw sewage reporter. And he says, oh, well, this report is so damning. Now, Ivan Raikland's rhetoric is so deadly. Jamie, is it as deadly as your beloved Michael Byrd slaughtering Ashley Babbitt? Is it as deadly as your beloved Lila Morris slaughtering Roseanne Boylan? Or is it as deadly as your beloved John Brennan that used drones without due process vigilante style to murder an American citizen abroad. Is it as deadly as that? My First Amendment protected sounds that expose you, Jamie Raskin, and your wife, Sarah Ratskin. So now you know why he's making these comments because he's leveraging his media complex to try to discredit everything that I'm working on. And what am I working on? Exposing Jamie Ratskin and his Fedsurrection cover-up involvement, as well as his wife's also going back to 2016 and 2017, which then unravels the next layer. The 51 spies who lied are mostly CIA 
senior level officials that had a role in working with the mentioned names that I said about the FBI lie to go ahead and coordinate and put out a public publication saying, hey, that laptop has all the earmarks of a Russian information operation, John Brennan said. And McLaughlin said, and Mike Morell said, and Jim Clapper said, I've been in the system. I've crossed paths with a lot of these people, okay? So it's not like they're just distant names for me. I know people that know them. I know people that work for them. I have insight better than almost anyone except for maybe two or three individuals, which would be General Flynn, yeah. Cash Patel, Maybe not Rick and Rick Grinnell knows a component of it, but Devin Nunes knows a, a large swath of this as well as the former I, FC chair. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. I, I do want to talk about General Michael Flynn because I think he's a really important part of the story and also really instructive. In I would say that he's the of... most instrumental part of this entire scheme because the initial transgression that they were trying to remove was their biggest threat to the deep state's order of continued yeah. corruption. So he, just, just for a they second, had to go after him and then subsequently cover up since then. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think I, I'd love to, for you to kind of start telling that story. But I, I just, you know, when on the surface of this, it ends up getting painted as a very partisan story and um, and artificially so. But that serves a, a very useful purpose to sort of say it's, you know, right wing versus left wing or whatever. But once you start unpacking it in the way you just did, I mean, we're talking about a lot of people who are appointees, a lot of people who are unelected. James um, Comey, Republican. So, Rod so Rosenstein, yeah, it's it goes across. That's what I'm trying to say. Exactly, it goes across. There, it, it's it's beyond parties, really. So one thing, and and I think this is where we can start to talk about General Flynn. But one thing I wanted to get into as well is, um, if you were able to clear house, essentially there'd be nothing left. I mean, we would tear the entire apparatus down and have to raise it up from scratch, right? Because there, it, it just goes so deep. Fantastic question. Okay. Two components, let me start with the first part. General Flynn was twice appointed by Barry Hussein to senior level positions. Number one, as the Assistant Director of National Intelligence for Partner Engagements. And he had the visibility on, I'll just leave it at that, you can look it up, everything, international, General State, Flynn's fam local. family, historically Democrat as well, right? Kennedy Democrats. He was a Democrat, registered Democrat going in as the national security advisor. Correct. For okay. President Trump. Okay. And then as the director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. Thank you. I was going to be the, the I was going to close out with that. The second point is that the, uh, both political party structures that are making money off of the war machine are in a position to not want to have General Flynn in the mix when he's trying to audit everything going on related to the military intelligence program, the national intelligence program, and the black budget, all the foreign policy stuff. Because as a national security advisor, you have purview over the largest swath portfolio of any official in government. Okay, It's kind of like a super cab, uh, cabinet level official. Okay. Right especially when your relationship with the president is the closest of any other cabinet level official, which it was. And I believe it remains today, but I can't speak on that. That would have to be a question for both of them <laughs> to answer. Now, there was one thing that you mentioned in that question, if you could repeat it, because it was very important. I needed to address. Can you rephrase the original question? Okay, well, it was, you're right, two questions. So one was just talking about General Flynn, who he is, and his story, because he is, like you, someone who started to see this very deep network and wanted to start to expose it because he's a patriot and wants the best for the country. President's former National Security Advisor, Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, pleaded guilty today for lies to the FBI he's investigating. Flynn knew exactly how the system worked. He knew exactly what the intel world had been up to. He understood its funding. They had to get rid of Flynn. There was a moment where I just felt like I was drowning. It was a mix of 
And so I'm in there with these other political appointees. They're all supposed to go in there and tell what they believe to be the truth. What they did was they took my my assessment and they and they wanted me to change it. And I was like, I'm not changing it. Get back. He was, by definition, the most dangerous possible person for Donald Trump to hire. President Obama said, but I do have one specific recommendation. Stay away from Michael Flynn. He's bad news. Over time, instead of being pounded down below the surface of the ocean, we started to fight. I'm now above the surface. The other piece of it was that this is such a deep and pervasive problem that really goes across party lines and yes. you know okay. any any kind of artificial bipartisan um, way of telling this is, is just it, it's silly. But that essentially we would have to bring things down to ashes. Those yeah, let me questions. If yeah. people label me, let, let's just make the assumption that a wrong one that everything written about me by Jamie Ratskin and his surrogates is true. So then they label me as like, or whatever, conservative. Republic, right, right. All right. So if you're the biggest radical leftist that's listening in on this, I ask the question, do you want me to go after the truth and expose both Mike Pence, his chief of staff, Joshua Pitcock, his wife, Joshua Pitcock's uh, wife, Catherine Seaman, who worked for Peter Strzok, who was the lead agent that with his friend, we'll call it, Lisa Page, who was the lawyer for Andy McCabe. Andy McCabe and Jim Comey were the two that sent two agents to get General Flynn to lie or to get him fired with no lawful predicate other than to get him fired or to get him to lie. Most of the people that I just told you about are Republicans. Mm -hmm. Mike Pence, his chief of staff, his wife, Rod Rosenstein was in the mix over as the deputy att attorney general. But the thing is, like, I don't know where to go. Other than, I'm just trying to right. seek the truth, right? Right. And so the most egregious belligerent activity that's really kicked this thing off is that the most respected intel officer, when we were like when I was serving, and my peers would say the same, General Flynn was it was known to speak truth to power, and he did not care if that would cause himself professional risk to his career. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is something that everyone lauds. And then when you're in a position to do that as the director of, in, uh, of the De defense intelligence agency, and you do that publicly in a armed services committee hearing in 2014, and you call it out and you're then resigned for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you're trying to, I mean, bottom line here is I'm trying to go after everybody that has stink and dirt on them to root out the rotten evil across both political spectrums. I would say this to close this part of it out. About 80 to 90% of the U.S. House is China first, Ukraine first, or Israel first, and or the combination of those three. Both political parties. On the Democrat side, it's closer to 100%. On the Republican side, it's probably in the three quarters percentile range. In the Senate, that number is probably in the 90 percentile. Okay. So to me, that's problematic as somebody that spent a quarter of a century basically swearing the oath on numerous occasions to defend the U.S. Constitution, not to defend China's Constitution or Israel's or Ukraine's or their interests. So... To me, that's problematic, and it's it, and the whole adage, hard times breed hard men and women. We are now at that point in time, and I revel when it's the hardest. People of my kind of background, I encourage it and want it because when there's a, a gap or a void in leadership, somebody has to step up, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would rather have somebody that has an Im impeccable background fill that void. And I think most people would agree with that, regardless of their political affiliation. In fact, 
I don't want them to have a political affiliation because right. that political affiliation is now part of a criminal syndicate that is perpetuating the demise of our constitutional order and perpetuating complete lies. Another well, person, Paul Ryan, a, Paul sorry. Ryan, Ryan's Priebus, uh, uh, let me, look, Paul Ryan, he left the, as the Speaker of the House. His sergeant at arms was Paul Irving. As he left as the Speaker and, and handed it over to Pelosi, she then keeps her own, her his sergeant at arms that Paul Ryan with Pelosi utilized to facilitate the Fed surrection on January 6th. That's mm -hmm. why you never hear on faux news, of which he's a board member. Fox is what some people pronounce it as. I prefer mm -hmm. faux news. That's why board member Paul Ryan of faux news never allows faux news reporters to say anything ill or negative of Mike Pence. That's why they can never say anything about exposing the Fed surrection. And when right. somebody does, they fire Tucker Carlson for it. Right, right, right. Like that. So the day I'm, after he was fired, so the day before he was going to air an interview mm -hmm. with Chief of Capitol Police, Stephen Sun, Paul Ryan was like, ooh, this could get a little too close with my fingerprints. We're going to have to kick you out, Tucker. And so I had the a, media, I had the a media is actually part of the deep Sun state. Before that. <laughs> the media is actually part of the deep state apparatus. So as you're clearing house, so you have to start clearing out um, all the different we aspects. We must bankrupt that sort of phone news. Up. We must bankrupt phone news, criminal news network, MSLSD, Washington so, Compost. So this is what I was going to ask. Climes, raw sewage. And then what? So how do you replace? Like Huffington you mentioned, Compost. you want to find impeccable we are people to replace right now. Where do you find people with impeccable backgrounds who are interested in doing this kind of thing? How do you know that they're not deep state assets as well? Like, where are you going to find thousands and thousands and thousands of people who are not corrupted, who want to do this kind of work? That's oh, that was question. the second part of the question that I want to address that you just reminded me. We take the same example that was used by CEO of Twitter. Your staff, did you fire at Twitter? One of the great business stories of the year. <laughs> I think we're about we're about 20% uh, of uh, the original size. Uh, so 80% left. Uh, yes. So how do you run the company with only 20% of the staff? Uh, it turns out uh, you don't need uh, that well that many people to run Twitter. But 80%? That's a lot. Um, yes. Uh, over. I mean, if you're, if you're not trying to run some sort of uh, glorified activist organization, uh, with, with uh, and you're not care that much about censorship, then uh, you can really let go of a lot of people, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> we can go ahead and remove 80, 90% of the force, and then the 10% that remain will continue to, in the most efficient way possible, continue to carry the constitutional banner. You know, the, the whole adage, 10% do the 90% of the work? Well, I'm fine with doing quality 90% work with 10% of the people. Because then there's less opportunity for corruption and there's more opportunity for those of us that now have full access to scrutinize those that are in positions of constitutional authority. I want a thousand people monitoring every government employee so that they're like, or whatever they're doing, military, they're doing it exactly how we authorize them to do it. That would be beautiful. It would be. So so President Trump promised when he was running previously that he was going to drain the swamp. And when he got in, he was unable to do it. He was stonewalled. So why do you think it would be successful now? I'm not saying it will be, but I will say why it didn't take place. The main function of why it didn't take place the first go around is because the deep state target list members first went after the, the the person with the most consequential ability to do just that was removed general flynn general flynn. the ecosystem that he would have brought in was subsequently downstream from that removed so in that aspect they were successful then they used all resources to go ahead like mike pence tried to get president trump to hire <coughs> robert Mueller on and, and he was doing it on behalf of the Bush-Cheney syndicate to, so that he, they would have oversight and control 
over the previous ops that they did to cover up for that illegal spying to create this box around Trump, which they they generally did at the Mueller investigation. Uh, and that was created because he wasn't hired as an FBLI director after Jim Comey was fired. So there's constant internal fighting and struggling to drain the swamp. But you had the uniparty swamp deep state's handler, yeah. Mike Pence, making sure that Trump was only receiving information from him. Mm-hmm. But there was always a battle. I mean, when you saw that those that were acting secretaries of XYZ were those that were not loyal to Mike Pence, the Cheney, Bush, Mitch McConnell, cabal. Because if they were, they would have been immediately confirmed by the Senate. Right. See how it works? And so, <clears throat> I mean, I'll let you ask the next question because I can go on tangents in, in, the, in the weeks on each yeah. of these different subjects. Yeah. <laughs> well, so you have been active on Twitter talking about September 3rd as a day to mark in the calendars. And you talk about the mother of all Twitter files. So tell us what's going to happen on that day and how you established that as a timeline. Yeah, so imagine, like, follow with me here. Imagine you listening in are Elon Musk, okay? That's one part of your brain. And the other part of your brain, you're Ken... Actually, let's just do it with Elon Musk. You are Elon Musk, and you just purchased X. You've been doing the Twitter files releases. You see that President Trump was basically... There was a failed assassination on him and you're wondering what kind of risk do I have with supporting him how can I mitigate that risk to my businesses myself and my family well if I'm Elon Musk I'm thinking okay I'm sitting on the biggest trove of criminal evidence that any human being has because when I'm gonna I'm gonna take the role as Elon Musk here so bear with me I tweeted in December of 22 that Twitter is not only a social media company, it's a crime scene. And then the following day I tweeted, my pronouns are prosecute Fauci. I wonder what I've learned since I tweeted that out as I've been looking and digging through with Michael Schellenberger and Matt Taibbi as they've exposed through the Twitter files. And I wonder what else we're missing. Now that I know that Jim Baker was the one that made sure that there was an NDA that forced the Twitter files journalists to not look at the direct messages of Twitter uh, accounts, and he was one of the ones complicit in this entire thing that Ivan Raikland's exposing, hmm, maybe we should look at the direct messages of Ivan's 600 member deep state target list Mm -hmm. how do i mitigate any back like how do i mitigate legal risk from doing that privacy issues or whatever i don't know he's like i'm not an attorney so then he's like he talks to his attorneys and then maybe he's like wait if my company's in california gavin news comes there pelosi's there uh they're gonna they're all on the deep state target list it might be safer to move twitter headquarters to texas for two reasons. One, so that I have the protections of my company from being politically targeted, just like Trump and Flynn and others in California, and that company can flourish. But number two, the attorney general in Texas is aligned with me because some of the members on the list that are associated and affiliated with the Bush Cheney syndicate just went after Ken Paxton and his impeachment, and he just destroyed them. And he's probably out for, let's just say, you fill in the blank. He's out for a little response. And so Ken Paxton would be in a position to not only provide top cover to Elon Musk, but also now is able to subpoena any Twitter files releases on Privacy Act or any you know, medical stuff, whatever, that shouldn't be released because Elon's trying to follow the rule of law. So... Now that Elon Musk has put, went all in to support President Trump, the same people going after 
attempting to assassinate him, to include Jamie Raskin and his wife Sarah, are the same ones that are trying to shut down Elon Musk, whether it's digitally, business-wise, or physiologically. So now that those interests are aligned, Elon Musk is probably of the opinion that I need to do everything in my influence as an individual with the holdings that I have lawfully, morally, and ethically in line with his First Amendment promoting values to expose to America all the criminal conspiracies that have taken place against the guy he just endorsed, which goes back to everything that I have laid out in the deep state target list. Mm -hmm. So then all it requires is, oh, there's about two, 300 Twitter accounts. Let's do a search and see what emails, what phone calls, text messages, internal Slack channel communications, and Twitter DMs with geotagged location data attached to it where they conducted these alleged treasonous actions that violate Texas treason laws or crimes in general. And then take that, and if it was done in Texas, good old Ken Paxson can prosecute. And if it was done in a specific county in Texas, then there's a DA that's going to take the precedent that was already done by Fulton Fanny or by and this Alvin is all hypothetical or this is all about to happen on September 3rd. Hold up. Hold up. You're getting ahead of yourself. Well, so then the DA getting a little lost to be honest, Ivan. Okay, so let me let me say it this way. What did Letitia James do in New York? What did the DA in Manhattan do? What did the DA in Fulton County, Georgia do? Okay. And then what did the law enforcement officials do to Ashley Babbitt and Roseanne Boylan that I explained? Mm -hmm. Using mm -hmm. that precedent, mm -hmm. which they called objectively reasonable, Elon and Ken Paxton disclose it, and then those particular law enforcement entities can now action all those members of the deep state target list within their jurisdiction if that jurisdictional hook is there, using the same precedent that they used. That's why they're coming after me, because they want to know if this is coming to fruition, because that is a legal method to create massive amounts of legal pain to them. And they want to stop it in its tracks by debunking me. Now, what if, for example, Ken Paxton pulls some data or the Twitter files releases some data related to, oh, Jamie Raskin was traveling through Kansas when he was coordinating this. Well, then Chris Kobach can go ahead and action that. He's the attorney general in Kansas or in Louisiana or any of the other two dozen plus states that have a red attorney general. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the methodology. And then it begs the next question. When would be the most ideal time from a business and political perspective to release this massive trove of criminal evidence? Wouldn't you want to do it and tailor it to whoever the, the nominee is going to be on the other side? August 22nd, we're going to know for sure, right? Because that's the last day of the DNC convention. But why would we release that uh, in late August when everybody's on vacation and everybody's on recess? Why not wait till the day after Labor Day? And why not also include with that criminal trove of evidence all of the whistleblower information that is now coming out concurrently because what I'm telling people on all the podcasts that I'm on is if you are a affiliate friend, family, neighbor, former employee or coworker of the 600 people on my deep state target list, and you know that you have direct evidence of that to be true. And you don't come out as a whistleblower by September 3rd, we will treat you as a co-conspirator and so we're going to investigate you until we find something and you're going to have to deal with that legally. If you have if you're willing to accept that legal risk to you personally, then go ahead and let, let's play let's play chicken as we move forward. If you don't want that legal risk, then you must come out as a whistleblower before September 3rd. And guess what? Massive whistleblowers are coming out. I'm getting basically daily a consequential individual 
in a particular institution by the categories that I'm mentioning that's coming out as a whistleblower. I'll give you one example. Last week, a very senior ranking official in the U.S. Capitol Police just came out to basically support with consistent evidence of what I've been explaining about the Fed's direction cover-up and those individuals involved. And one of those involved is the current Capitol Police chief who was teed up by Jamie Ratskin to be the U.S. Capitol Police chief because he lives in Montgomery County, and so does his wife, and he endorsed his wife for a political position. I got a link analysis diagram on all these people. Mm -hmm. so, so, short answer to that question. Yeah, yeah. If Elon Musk does not do this, I don't see him surviving as a businessman financially as well as physically because they cannot like there's no other option like he's done and not for me like i support him but they're going to do everything in their power to take him out they being the deep state those on my list okay and beyond so like there's, there's global players that i don't have on the list there uh but those are like i focus more on the u.s component because once we get our own house in order i call yeah, it yeah yeah once we castrate the deep state, then we can go after the broader global component, which is crushing the commies. Right. And there's so much to do just there. And I can see why, you know, you've done oh, three and hour three podcasts. And Fortunately, yeah. I have my next one. Let, let me just close, though, <laughs> by saying that what, what you've just laid out is incredibly important, but incredibly complex. And for your average Joe it's going to be a lot to try and unpack. So what is your kind of practical advice, your one sentence elevator pitch for someone who's watching this? What do you want someone to take away from this? Contact Attorney General Ken Paxton, go to the website and ask him how much, ask him what he's doing as it relates to the mother of all Twitter files. And if you want to make a second call, Go ahead and put out a tweet demanding that Elon Musk release the Fauci files and all the rest of the deep state target list information that he's sitting on that Matt Taibbi is already. I had a five hour meeting with Taibbi last week. Okay. So like I'm, I'm working the problem. I need more people to give forth that demand signal okay, to make great. it inevitable. Well, tell people how they can find you and follow what you're doing. I'm at Ivan Raiklin on X, Rumble, Telegram, Truth, Getter, Clout Hub, Gab, and Substack. Great. The free and, speech platforms. Not fake. And they can book, email not you directly. Garbage, not commie tube, not commie search. And yeah, info at raiklin.com if you want me to come on your show to kind of work, go into more detail. But bottom line is, this evidence will then allow America to demand their state legislatures to hold a roll call vote on November 5th to allocate their state's presidential and vice presidential electors. And last I checked, Republican legislatures control 274 electoral votes, guaranteeing no fraud occurs in the election. And we do it according to the Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2 mandate in our U.S. Constitution. Free, fair, fully transparent, live stream vote of the legislatures. And then we... Uh, start to remedy from both angles, bottom up county and at the federal level on down to clean house. Well, Ivan, thank you so much for coming here and laying all this out and hopefully you'll come back and we can talk a little bit more about some of the solutions on another podcast. Yes, ma'am. Thanks, Zara. Thank uh, what is it? Mamnoon. <laughs> Haley Mamnoon. <laughs> Well, friends, I am sure you have a lot of opinions about what you just heard. So please tell us what you think in the comments. Collapse Life is here to have the conversations no one else is having. And we aim to open people's eyes and share stories that make you think about things in a new way. If you like what we're doing, please like and subscribe so we can sh reach more awakening minds. We also have a Substack in addition to this video channel, and we hope to see you there as well. You can find us at collapselife.substack.com. We're also building an audience on X and our handle there is at collapse underscore life. Plus we have a merch store with t-shirts and aprons and mugs and other fun stuff. So please be sure to check that out. And then we'll see you back here next week with another great guest. So 
Until then, keep your chin up. It's only collapse. See you soon.